Um, firstly, thank you for everyone for coming along. Um, I guess uh, since kind of my arrival back in New South Wales about two and a half, three years ago, uh, we've tried really hard to implement our uh, offensive style of play and our defensive style of play, in which Curtis will speak a little bit about later. Um, and the main reason we've done this is um, we're trying to follow the Basketball Australia style of play, um, what they're trying to put in, uh, as we really believe it will give our athletes the best opportunity to not only be a successful basketball player, but maybe live their dreams um, and represent Australia one time. So what is an offensive style of play? An offensive style of play is created to provide athletes with a foundation and guide on how to successfully manage an offensive possession through the use of a shot clock. I think one of the main misconceptions out there is style of play is a system of play. It's, it's flow, it's flex, it's shuffle, it's an actual offense uh, where we, what, what in actual fact it is, is kind of the framework. So if you were to run an offense um, and someone was to break out of it, what we'd then get into is our style of play. In the poise section, um, we, we split the shot clock, shot clock up into three eight seconds and the first eight seconds, and I'll unpack this as we go. Uh, the first eight seconds is pace, the middle eight seconds is poise, and the last eight seconds is penetration. Basketball Australia um, kind of describe their offensive style uh, in, the ter in terms of playing with awareness and purpose in all phases of the team's, of the team's possession. So as I just touched on earlier, we're really trying to align with Basketball Australia's style of play. So in 2013, Andre Lamanis and Brendan Joyce kind of uh, started developing the Australian style of play. Um, and since then, um, obviously with Sandy Brondello coming in, she's taken bits of it on the female side. Um, and obviously Andre's continued that on now with Brett Brown taking over. Um, they'll obviously adjust it and add bits to it um, with, and we have done the same in our style of play at New South Wales. Um, but again, we've kind of, we've really adopted it. So our athletes have the opportunity to then represent uh, not only their state, but then have the possibility to go on and represent their country. Um, and in my opinion, um, I think the greatest privilege of all coaches is to watch their athletes move past them, um, to grow and to um, become better than kind of what we ever became, right? I think that's a great, um, as a mentor, as a coach, that's something we really aspire for our athletes to do. Um, and we really feel that if, if the associations and the domestic level teams or club teams can adopt parts of the style of play, it will just make it easier for their transition into our programs. And then it will then make it easy for, if we can kind of add layers to it, it'll make that their transition easier for when they go to basketball Australia camps or try out for Australian teams. So building our base, skill underpins our style of play. So in essence, if, if we were to look at it, building a house, the concrete slab is our super six. So our pivoting, passing, ball handling, shooting, one-on-one -on -one defense and decision-making. Now we practice those in isolation and here with the concrete slab, you can see that soon they'll add some layers to it. So now we're gonna add in some advantage, disadvantage drills. So some one-on-one, -on -one, some one-on-two, two-on-one, just to add some layers. So they put in a situation where they've got to use those individual skills, okay, in an environment where they're gonna make a decision. So we work really hard at all our individual sessions to improve their fundamental skills, and we call that the super six. So our pace phase, this is the first eight seconds. So I kind of look at this as our first wall that we want to build up our framework now when building a house. So in all our offensive transition, it must start with boxing out and securing the defensive rebound. We then want to sprint the floor and look for kick ahead passes. And I'll unpack this a little bit later. We want early ball screens to relieve pressure. So smash, punch or drag screens. We want to attack the rim. So we want to try to get layups. So layups are still gold. All right, if we can't get layups, we want to play off two feet in the key, which then limits our chances of turnover. So we can make a successful pass out of the key. We want to look to get to the free throw line or kick out three point shots, depending on the age group you're coaching. Spacing is essential and vital. We really want to make sure athletes have the spacing. But if you have a team that can't take 
uh, three-point shots or take a high percentage of three-point shots, you might say to them, start outside the three and then step in to shoot a long two. We then want to work on our split kick and extra pass rules, which we'll go over a little bit later as well, and our five Ds on penetration. So our middle eight seconds, now I believe this is one of the most important parts, is kind of our other three walls, right? Um, this is the area where you put in your flavor as a coach, okay? So shuffle cuts, cross screens, down screens, on ball screens, dribble handoffs, whatever you want to do. But out of that, we have certain rules that we follow um, when cutting, uh, when someone drives, okay? So here we want to have hard cuts. So we always cut the score. We really want to emphasize ball reversal and moving the ball quickly. We want to try to get the ball in the key, as spoken about earlier, play off two feet. Five Ds on penetration. Open kick out threes plus, plus extra passes. We want to take predictable shots in this segment. We don't want to take shots that we as a team aren't kind of expecting because that then hurts our defensive transition. So we really want to take predictable shots in this segment. We definitely don't want to take contested shots. Okay, so trying to find the open player. Oops, sorry. So, and then lastly, when the shot goes up, all right, or if it was to go up, then we can get into our D trans, which Curtis will talk about a little bit later. So our penetration, this is the last eight seconds. All right, so let's say we've used the first eight, middle eight. Now we're getting down to the last eight seconds. So this is our roof, right? We're holding everything together. This is the part that we really need to excel in. So we've worn down the D and we try to get a great shot. So we want uncontested shots here. We want to try to get to the free throw line. We want to attack the rim aggressively. We want deep post catches, okay? We want to try to get dribble, pass, and cutting penetration. We want to set a great screen. So we're really emphasizing get a teammate open. We want to take predictable, uncontested shots. We don't want to settle for a step back three pointer or a fadeaway three, which we've all seen every player see a professional do then try to replicate. Okay, this is a great time to score, not panic. We really want to try to get to the free throw line. And on the rise of the shot, that's where our defensive transition kicks in. So I'm now going to unpack our pace phase. Okay, and at the end of the pace phase, I'll have time for some questions and then we'll move on to the poise. So our options to advance the ball in the pace phase. So if there's a quick outlet, we obviously want to give it to our point guard as quick as possible. If you have twos and threes who have the ability to dribble the ball up the floor or a four, then we want to encourage that. All right, but we want to try to get a quick outlet so then we can get the ball up the floor as quick as possible. Now, if there's not much pressure, okay, we really want to encourage uh, the point guard to either take, as we've seen diagram one here, to take a step towards the ball. All right, I think I've got a pointer here I can use. Yep, so one can take a step towards the ball for a quick outlet or a quick inbound pass. Or if there is a little bit of pressure, five can set a screen for one to sweep off. Now, remember if the four, if the ball has gone in, the four can run the baseline. Pass gets thrown in. And here in diagram two, we see the four and the one kind of staying what we call the alleyway. We try not to have them go too close to the sideline and that's where our trapping areas are. So we have our two and three really sprinting the floor to encourage or to give one a kick ahead pass. And that's something we encourage all our teams to do. And I'm sure you do the same to have a kick ahead pass that can apply pressure on the rim early. If we can't get a kick ahead pass as seen in diagram three here early, on the same side, they can dribble across the split line and kick ahead to the other side, okay? Like I said, lastly, very important that we keep away from our trapping areas here at halfway uh, so our point guard doesn't get into trouble. Now, if there is pressure on the point guard, so we can set two types of screens uh, to relieve some pressure for our point guard. Now, the first one's a smash screen. So in diagram one, let's say the point guards come off the screen from the five, and as soon as they've got the catch, one's put great pressure on the point guard and it's, the, the point guard's found it really hard to break them down off the dribble. The four can get ahead of the point guard. So now it's really hard for X1 to see four come and set the screen. And it's important here that we're in between the alleyway, so in the middle corridor, our angle of the screen is important. So our feet face the corner here. 
All right, and one really sets their player up. So they might take a dribble this way if they can and then come off this screen. Now, we encourage the four to, I guess, put some terror in X1's uh, brain thinking that next time it's gonna happen, um, it could really hurt that screen. Obviously nothing illegal, but we wanna really make sure that the defender guarding the ball here, all right, they're gonna be looking over their shoulder so they worry about the screen. All right, so that's what we call a smash screen. The next type of screen is a punch screen. So when the ones caught the ball, let's say they do go off a little bit here in the fours trailing. All right, this one here, the five can set a punch screen. So again, the position, we don't wanna to be too close to the sideline. We wanna stay in the middle corridor. All right, the five will pick and pop because the four and the five here become interchangeable. So the five's angle, their feet face the baseline just so it's a wider screen, it's much harder for the defender to get around. Now, once we've gotten the ball over halfway, we really wanna encourage what we call split kick and extra pass. So we're looking to put heat on the rim, okay, as quick as possible to get layups, to get to the free throw line, or kick out three pointers, depending on the group you have again. To achieve this, we try to get a numbers advantage or create a split, so right here, when two got past their player, that's what we call a split. Then you've seen they've got into the free throw, uh, that they've got into the key, sorry. All right, and when they get into the key, they really wanna play off two feet. All right, so as you see two get past their player here, X3 must come to help. Two can hesitation, Steve Nash dribble around, and then play off two feet. All right, obviously they can be athletic to score. If not, they'll kick out to an open play, and that's the next phase. The next phase is kick. So as we see here, two drives the ball into the key. X3 will rotate. And O3 must sprint to what we call the drift position, which we'll unpack soon as well. All right, now here in the corner, they wanna get in the stance as quick as possible, hungry hands, and they catch the ball on a jump stop to avoid stepping out here on the sideline. If the defense is in the way, they can slightly relocate. Okay, so here you see X4 jump in. If they're in the passing lane, they're just relocating either a little bit high or a little bit low, just so there's a passing lane. Okay, or if X4 is ball watching, they can back cut to the basket. Receiver's rule here is to catch and shoot if they're outside the perimeter or catch and make the extra pass. And we'll talk about why in a second. The extra pass, so the next receiver, so here that's represented by 0-4. All right, we wanna gain an advantage, so we must start off the baseline. Okay, oh sorry, off the three-point line. So we can catch with momentum and either use that for our shot or attack a long closeout and drive. We wanna drive into space. So typically we drive through the elbow or away from where the ball came from. We previously spoke about the rules of O3, either they shoot or pass. Now, most of the time that is the rule, unless we get to an older level where they're quite smart, most of the time that rule's in place because here you see X4 collapse. So any type of penetration defense collapses. And then if we were to drive off the first kick out, you're essentially driving into a person who hasn't quite closed out and you're going into defense. Where if we were to make an extra pass, we can then attack a longer closeout and there'd be more space for us to drive into. So here you see X03 uh, just driving into the defender. Okay. So split kick and extra pass can happen in any play phase. So right here you see some clips of some NBA teams with some fantastic passes. What, act what action can we run to create split kick and extra pass opportunities? We can use this with dribble penetration. We can use it with pass penetration. We can use it with post action. We can use it with several types of screens. So ball screens, dribble handoffs or DHOs, down screens, flare screens, etc. Or you can just use it by cutting action. So any time someone breaks the line of where the defender is, who they're guarding, or they catch it cut into the basket, or there's a post up, we're in our receiver rules, or we're in our split kick and extra. It is vital 
that when we let the athletes use their creativity, or it is vital that we get, let the athletes use their creativity out of the pace phase, or use one of the above concepts to create numerical advantage, that the other four players get into a position to receive a pass. And these are called our receiver spots, which I'll go over. Are there any questions quickly, Jared, around the pace phase? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah, perfect. So there was one question, are press breakers a part of the pace phase? Yeah, they are a part of the pace phase. Um, there is a press breaker um, that I learned in Basketball Tasmania that Mark Radford incorporated into uh, his transition floor spots. Okay, so what uh, that press breaker was, and what we'll do at the end of this, there's, there's a whole package of drills Curtis and I have put together. Jared will email that out to everyone, and I can put the press breaker in there. Um, so it is incorporated into the pace phase. Um, obviously, it'd just be they want to try to slow us down, but we can still look to attack off that. So I think it's vital that within our um, floor spots of our press, press breaker, we still look to play with pace and attack. Uh, that's essential. Otherwise, they just keep pressing us. Another question, mate. Uh, the, the program that you use to draw up those little X's and O's, um, what program is that? If you could give a uh, Is this the quote. diagram or the actual the X's and O's? So the, uh, the, the moving little counters. Yeah, okay. So that's called Coach Note, and it's not available anymore. So I've got on my iPad that I got about eight years ago, and I haven't updated it because if I update it, it actually disappears. So unfortunately, it's not available anymore. Unless you want to buy my iPad, iPad off me, and I'll sell it to you for eight hundred dollars. Um, last one, mate. How willing are you to take quick transition threes, kick aheads, dribble up, etc.? Uh so when I was oh, at a junior level, hardly ever. Um, I think there's only probably a handful of players in Australia at the junior level who could potentially do that. Um, when I was with Townsville, one of the um, rules we put in place, we did a receiver three-point shooting drill um, every practice session. So athletes would shoot 43-point shots. Um, and if they got over 70% in that on a consistent basis, they were allowed to take um, transition three-point shots, okay? AKA Clint Steiner was allowed to do that. Um, and he was the, really the only one. I think Mirko Jerick was as well. They were the only two that were allowed to do that. Fantastic, mate. Thanks for that. All right. I can't see you, so I'm just going off your voice. All right. Uh, so now we move into the poise phase. Uh, if the pace phase has been taken away, team's ability to function in the half court Move the ball to create an offensive advantage and take uncontested shots is paramount when you verse a good defensive transition team. When put under pressure, we as human beings always revert to habit, no matter what we do. Okay, so it's vital that we have rules that all athletes follow. Now, rules that don't take away creativity. I think that's one of the, the common misconceptions out there that if you put rules in, oh, you're not letting athletes play. Um, but it's more like you're giving them a boundary uh, to work within. We never take away their creativity, but we want to ensure that one, the athlete knows the limitations, okay? They don't over dribble it, for example. And two, it's really important that the other four players have an idea of what that player is going to do. Because I think that's when most teams are unsuccessful in, in, in scoring a bucket because you have five players essentially running around there with their heads cut off. Um, but if you can work together as one unit, you're more likely to score. Okay, so we all revert to habit. Um, so if, if athletes were to break out, um, create up the dribble, pass, they get into what we call our receiver spots, which we will unpack very soon. In this phase, we really want our athletes to have ball movement, play movement, and extra passes. So as a coach, you would add your little flavor, uh, your offense based on your personnel, but you would encourage, the, encourage these three things, I would assume, ball movement, play movement, and extra pass. The number one rule of receivers is you never let one defender guard two players. Um, I, I called Paul Goris today just to kind of get an update of the Opal style of play and, and really what they're trying to do. And he spoke about space being essential and being really important to them, the way they play. So just making sure that athletes are, are, are part enough that one defender can't guard two, 
and then we can attack gaps uh, from cutting, passing, uh, or dribble penetration. So here on the side, we, we really are kind of emphasize these three things, not only in the, the half court, but the full court, right? So creativity, we want to let athletes get out there and play the game and enjoy playing the game. We do give them some rules and boundaries, and then it's essential that we do play with space. So here we're going to break down our receiver rules. So our five Ds on penetration. Um, now, I know growing up, I heard a variety of rules. Like that's the, the drifter, you have the lifter, you have the uh, bailout, um, a lot of different rules. And the reason why we have five Ds, it's just easier for the athletes to understand. Okay, so similar to the five Ds of dodgeball, these are the five Ds of the basketball New South Wales kind of style of play. So our first one's the driver or the cutter who receives it on the pass. This player's aim is to split their defender, to score or draw a defender to pass. We encourage this athlete when inside the key to come to a jump stop. If they jumped, it was, if they jumped and it wasn't to score, then we encourage them to only jump to make a pass, not jump to find a pass. So we're not taking away their you know, athleticism, we're just making sure that they have an understanding that if they can't score quickly and early in the air, then they've got to come to a jump stop to then pivot and pass. Once they pass the ball, they must then sprint out of the key to open up space uh, and then hopefully get to an open, sh uh, open spot to then take an open shot. The other receivers, so we'll go to the far side here. All right, they're the lowest weak side perimeter player. So whenever someone on the strong side, so that's the side that the ball is on, when they make a move towards the basket, the player on the weak side, they're called the drift or the drifter. So they sprint to the baseline here, okay, ready to catch and shoot the ball in a stance. The drifter also has other options. They can back cut if their player's ball watching. They can lift. Now, when might they lift? If four he was to back cut, three has the option of lifting. All right, so there are some options they have. The rule on this player, especially at a junior level, under 12s, 14s, potentially 16s, if they catch the ball on the perimeter, they must shoot the ball or they must make the extra pass, okay, to the diagonal. And the reason why we spoke about that, as I explained earlier, defense collapses. We don't want to then redrive into defense who have already collapsed. The next receiver here is the diagonal. Okay, so they're generally the highest weak side perimeter player. So when someone on the strong side, again, makes a move towards the basket, all right, the diagonal sprints to the wing. All right, and they're not on the three-point line. They want to be a step back. All right, and they also have a few options. Okay, they can back cut. They can catch and shoot. Or off the pass from the drift position, they can catch and redrive. All right, so the rule with this player here is we always want to have them off the three-point line so they can use that momentum to shoot it or redrive. The next play is what we call the dunker. All right, the five, or again, the four, five interchangeable. If I'm coaching on the 12s, I'm making sure every player plays every position. Okay, this player starts in what we call the dead low position. Now, um, kind of what I was taught growing up um, was you would run rim to rim and then you'd go ball side. We don't not do that, but percentages show uh, I spoke to Michael Cassidy not too long ago, and he's put a package together of the uh, statistics that the Boomers did at the World Cup. And first side post-ups are actually really low, um, whereas in female basketball, they're quite high. Okay, so uh, depending on who you have, you would replicate or adjust that to your team. But we kind of encourage our athletes when running rim to rim, they get opposite the ball. So this opens up our driving opportunity to attack. So the dead low, they want to be probably lower than where they are. So their heels are on the baseline. And what that does, it actually drops their defender lower, which opens up this drive through the middle. Or if they don't drop lower and they ball watch, it gives them the opportunity to move beneath them um, and get a catch. So <clears throat> when they play a drive, let's say two drives middle, five will wheel underneath the basket. Okay. To the charge circle, so they've got a little stuff. The passes we encourage to to throw here are no strike zone passes. So a strike zone pass is something between the shoulder and the hip. 
So we don't pass the ball anywhere between there because defensively they can get a deflection. So it's a pocket pass or a lob pass. If they were to drive baseline, then five wheels around to the top of the charge circle here. Now, wheeling beneath the defender here or the backboard, that's an excellent way uh, to teach a five to play against the zone also. Teach them to play beneath the zone defense, okay, and they can get those little cheapy. Nick K is fantastic at that. Now we have the drag position. If this player is located on the same, or this player is located on the so, same side as the driver, all right, and then as the driver goes to the basket, the one drags in behind. This, pro, this provides the driver with a bailout pass. They also have the option of back cutting if their defender's in the passing lane also. Again, the rule, they must start off the three point line um, if they haven't cut to the basket, just to use that for momentum. So here are some advantage, disadvantage drills that we put together. Um, this is an excellent one I love to do. I'll do this for a warm-up, again, depending on what you want your athletes to achieve and, and if they're good three-point shooters. Now, the reason I actually don't mind doing this uh, as a warm-up, um, I remember I listened to a podcast one time and, and the coach who they were interviewing, um, they asked him what shooting drill they start with and he said three-point shooting. And they said, oh, why is that? And they said, well, usually the first shot athletes take when they come on the floor is a three-point shot. So why would we not practice that? Um, again, depending on the age group you're coaching, um, I would sometimes start with this. Sometimes I wouldn't. I'd work on some things inside, walling up. Uh, but this is a great drill to start with just because it gets their brain uh, working and, and start to think. So here I have X1 just making a layup. This initiates the drill. One and two would then sprint to the drift and the diag. And then one just passes the ball out to, uh, sorry, X1 passes the ball out. And X1 can close out to the person they pass it to or the other person who hasn't got the ball. And the receiver's just got to make a decision. Do they catch and shoot? Do they catch and pass? Okay. And then you can progress it two on two. So we then sometimes start with one on one here with the defenders. All right. And the first person who gets the rebound throws it out, closes it out. The second person can close out to a help position. All right. So they were adding some limitations. So you might either add other limitations. There might be, one dribble or two dribbles or whatever it might be, you might have to make three passes uh, or one pass just to score. All right, and our points of emphasis for the offense, um, sprint to your spot, hungry hands, all right, spacing and stance, and then you read the defenders. With every drill we do, we always teach two ways. So we'll teach offense and we'll teach defense. I just haven't showed the defense here because Curtis will go through defense. Another drill we do, one-on-one -on -one creating a split. Uh, again, you can start by giving the offense an advantage. So if defense was quite good here, you could start them with their back to the three-point line. An offense might start with the ball on their back and then they just rip it either way. And that just gives the offense an advantage. All right, so we're playing one-on-one -on -one off here. Uh, again, add some limitations. You might go three bounce max. Um, you might make it a point system. So if you get a straight line drive as an offensive player, you get a point. If defense turns them, they get a point. So you're adding little things that actually really make the athlete um, break down the detail of the drill uh, and then they get more out of it, more out of the drill. All right, so they get more out of the skill, more out of the drill. Uh, and then we have our points of emphasis there. Another one, so we'll go two on one, uh, driver and drift. Uh, so here, one will drive the ball. They can start by a spin out by coach. Uh, X1 can rotate to help, which would then make one pass the ball or X1 might just go to the player who's gone to the drift position, okay? And that means then O1's got to score. So I would just encourage X1 to make different decisions, okay? To put O1 in a position where they've got to make a decision that's best for the team. Sorry if I'm going through this a bit too quickly. I'll probably have to speed it up a bit. Uh, next one's driver and dunker. All right, so we put the dunker opposite. Now I know it's two, but again, play players in many positions so they get a good understanding. Uh, and one drives, they can wheel underneath, they can wheel high. Uh, to progress it, you might have X1 standing here with the ball on their back so then they can rip and get on the rim. We really want to encourage, we call this two and two. So the uh, offensive player on the perimeter takes two hard bounces and comes to a two foot jump stop. So they're not taking six bounces to get in the key. We have, we have given them a plan and we want them to execute that plan uh, so we can get a great shot. 
Here's a really good one that we pretty much do every camp, every every um, trial that we have. Uh, three on two, split kick and extra. Okay, we can progress it to three on three. Um, so defense, you know, everyone's probably done this drill before. They'll pass it, they'll close out. So we're working on a variety of things here. Really encourage offensive players to be down the stance, hungry hands, quick reversal, and then two looks to attack. Okay, so here you see two attacking. Now, in this situation, I've given one the option to drag or fill diag. Now, let's say one drags behind. So I should have had a picture for this. I apologize, but hopefully you can visualize with me. If one drags in behind here and there's no drift, there's no player at the scene, and there's enough space here, so we call this double spacing, and the ball gets kicked out, then one would have the ability to redrive because there's no one to pass to. Okay, they're attacking the long closeout and there's no one in a help position one pass away. But if they were to go this side where there is someone in the drift, well, then we've got to make the extra pass as seen here. Any questions, Jared, around the poise phase? Yeah, mate, uh, Beck had a question for you. Beck, could I get you to unmute yourself, mate, to ask your question, please? Yeah, I'm just going, hi, Sam. I'm just How going back to the um, dunker with the five man where you said um, about the female, uh, females yep. being able to be strong side. Was that specifically yep. for the Opals or is that something we can look at for our, ho our whole girls program? I think both. I yep. mean, I, I had the under 18 Metro girls this year. Um, and I had opposite only because I, I really want everyone to touch the ball as quick as possible in offense. Yep. Um, and essentially, if we promote a ball reversal, then everyone touches the ball. Yeah, um, sure. It also shifts the defense side to side. But I'm also aware that takes five seconds doing that sometimes, which eats into the clock. Yep. Um, so I think it would depend on your personnel. Um, we do teach away, but... The way the game evolves, you know, in a year's time, we could go, oh, yeah, we might teach go ball side. Okay, but the rules kind of stay if the five was the same side and two drove the ball here, the five could just duck into the dunker spot here. Okay, yeah. if, the, if the two drove the ball baseline, then the five can just circle and wheel up to the top here in the dunker position. So we kind of keep with our rules of where the five players go on any sort of penetration. Yep, sweet. Okay, thank you. I didn't. I just didn't know if it was just sort of a Liz Cambage um, specific. Well, that would if you had her, <laughs> yeah. it'd be, it'd be awesome, mate. Right? Yeah, that, that's all I thought. Yeah, thanks, Sam. No worries. Cheers. You're right to keep going, mate. All right. Get back to where I was. All right. So our last phase is the penetration phase. Now this phase. Um, if the pace and the poise phases have been taken away, it is vital that we have a plan of attack that all athletes revert to in order for us to achieve the best possible outcome. Now, I'm sure we've all seen many situations where uh, we get the ball, uh, there's eight seconds left, and we all start counting down, and the point guard dribbles it out, and they take one or two bounces and shoot a three-point shot. Uh, and it's not the best shot we can take. Now, sometimes it does go in, right, and we all cheer and you think, oh, great, terrible shot. Uh, but we want to have a plan of attack. We want to give the athletes something um, that they can revert to when there is eight seconds left on the shot clock. There is 10 seconds left. Or we get an offensive rebound. It's a reset to 14. So here's some kind of options below, okay? But we should never settle for a contested shot in this situation. We should be exploring ways to get to the rim. By this stage of the shot clock, the defense has had to deal with a lot of movement, right? We spoke about ball movement, play movement, extra passes in the poise phase, and usually help defenders locate on the weak side are not in great position. We encourage athletes to have great spacing and to help exploit whatever best possible outcome can be achieved by our personnel. So some examples we have below, okay, are middle ball screen, and the reason why we go a lot of middle ball screen now, it's a lot harder to help off a middle ball screen. Okay, creates a little bit more space for us. All right, there's some post action. Now, this is just something we have. You might have a different post action, that's fine. And the last one we have here is an isolation play. But all everything we have here, you see there's some sort of kind of penetration we're trying to get. In the middle ball screen, they're trying to turn the corner here, get two feet in the paint. Okay, so that's of dribble penetration. Uh, here, we have a pass penetration into the post 
our two's cutting off that. So we're trying to get some cutting and pass penetration. And here we might just think, well, a lot of teams nowadays in the penetration phase, they just switch the onboard. And athletes aren't great at a young age of exploiting the mismatches. Um, and if there's three seconds left, it makes it even harder, right? Because we can't dribble out and throw it in. So here we might just let our best creator one-on-one -on -one take their player off the dribble. And then our other three, uh, sorry, other four players in our receiver positions. You see how the three's lifting here. So they're, uh, they're dragging him behind if they drive this way. The fives being the dunker or the wheeler going underneath the basket. And then we have our drift and diag this side. So you see whatever happens whenever we revert to some sort of penetration, uh, pass dribble, okay, or cutting that we get into our five Ds. Lastly, I've gone through quicker than I thought. Lastly, we have then the what's next mentality. Um, so this is something we really preach to all our athletes. And I would encourage you to do, pardon me, I would encourage you to maybe try something like this. So let's say you're doing a, a three on three in the half court and you can only play in the half court. I know some of you only get the half court to play. Um, so you might do three on three and you'd always have the what's next mentality. So the game would not stop after the shot's made or defense has got the ball. We would always kind of do the, well, if we're on offense and we shoot the ball, we would incorporate our defensive transition rules, whatever you have as a coach. And then we might play three on three up to like the netball third, that line, that, that other sport that we play. Um, so we kind of add in areas where there's always that what's next mentality where athletes have to change and transition from O to D quickly or D to O. And that would just help with uh, their evolution as becoming a basketball player. I really hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, I'm sorry if I spoke a bit too quickly. I'm really happy to answer any questions.